Good morning. Welcome to our 2024 Federal Society Annual Western Chapters Conference here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. My name is Lisa Ezell. I'm the Vice President for our Lawyers Chapters. Um, our division hosts about 15 regional conferences around the country, but this was the first one that we started back in 2007. So it's always a very special place for us to come here. Um, we have a great crowd this year. I think we have, I don't know, eight or nine states represented, maybe more than that. So um, it's wonderful to see uh, so many um, old and new friends here this weekend. Um, this year we decided to organize panels around um, touching upon the crisis in institutions and we are delighted that we can show, showcase so many diverse perspectives on these discussions and we hope you learn something today. Um, they will touch upon attacks on judicial independence and allegation that the Article 3 has become too political, voter and election integrity, and challenges to education after COVID. We are also happy to welcome our friend Greg Jacob who served as counsel to Vice President Mike Pence who will offer some keynote remarks today. I would also like to encourage everybody here to get to know your local chapters. I think we have most of our lawyers chapter presidents from the West here, including um, I think our newest, newly revived chapter in Hawaii. So we encourage everybody, um, I think most of our chapter leaders have a designation on their name tag. So if you aren't involved in a chapter, um, please introduce yourself. I believe we have leaders from LA, Orange County, San Diego, Sacramento, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Fresno, Colorado, Phoenix, Vegas, Seattle, and New Mexico, um, as well as Montana. So quite a, quite a diverse showing um, this weekend. Last but not least, I want to thank our friends at the Institute for Justice. We hosted a very lively and opinionated tavern debate last night. It is such a joy to partner with them, so I want to thank them for agreeing to do this with us once again, and we hope we can do this again next year. Um, before we begin our first panel, I would like to introduce Kay Rosen. She's a Director of Development here at the Ronald Reagan Foundation, and she's going to offer a special welcome and tell you a little bit about their work. Kay. Thank you, Lisa. So on behalf of our President and CEO, David Trulio, welcome back to the Reagan Library. We're so glad to have you back here, and you've been here, I know, for many years, and so we appreciate that you're holding your Western Conference here again. Um, Dave is traveling and wishes he could be here with everyone. So Dave has been a member of the Federalist Society since back in law school in the 90s, and he was chapter president at Columbia Law School, and while there, he had, as a guest speaker, someone who I believe is here with us today, uh, Dr. Eugene Bull. Bullock. Dr. Bullock, are you here? I am, but I'm not oh. a <laughs> Professor Jean Bullock, Dave says hello. <laughs> so, speaking of law school, uh, my nephew is a first year law student at University of Chicago and a proud member of the Federalist Society. So, we appreciate that you feel so at home here at the Reagan Library in this beautiful setting. And um, this is where we can promote the legacy and principles of Ronald Reagan. Economic opportunity, individual liberty, freedom and democracy, peace through strength, and national pride. And I want to thank each of you for upholding conservative principles and serving as an example to young Americans. So right here at the Reagan Library in the summer, we'll be hosting our Great Communicator Debate Series. And that is a national debate tournament we hold for high school students across the nation. We would love to have some of you as judges, either for the finals here at the library or at one of our regional tournaments across the United States. So if you are interested, please find me. We would love to have you. Dave, we'll see you next year, if not sooner. <coughs> Thank you so much, Kay, and thank, um, I'd like to thank everybody associated with the Reagan Library for being such a wonderful host to us. Um, we look forward to coming back every year, and it's been a wonderful tradition. Um, with that, I'd like to call up the panelists for our first panel. Um, and one other housekeeping note, um, we have four and a half hours of CLE available. You need to sign in on the QR code on your program, so I would encourage everybody to do that right now if you're looking for CLE. If you have any tech problems or questions, just find somebody um, a student volunteer, one of my colleagues, and we can help with that. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce the moderator um, for 
our opening panel, Judge Carlos Bea, who probably needs no introduction with this crowd. Um, judge Bea is, um, serves as a judge in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He received his bachelor's degree from Stanford University and his JD from Stanford Law School. Judge Bea was born in San Sebastian, Spain, and immigrated with his family um, to Cuba in 1939. In 1952, fun fact, he represented Cuba on the Cuban national basketball team in the Helsinki Olympics. He became a United States citizen in 1958. He um, engaged in legal practice in San Francisco and served as a judge on the San Francisco Superior Court from 1990 to 2003. He was nominated by President George W. Bush to the Ninth Circuit and confirmed in 2003 and assumed senior status in late 2019. He has been a, a frequent moderator at these conferences over the years and we're delighted he can join us once again. Judge Bea, I will turn things over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Um, today's subject of this panel is uh, the attacks on the court, what's being done as to the usual institution. And um, I've been around long enough to uh, remember and see the difference between the attacks on the court that were done in the 1950s and 1960s when there were impeachable warrant signs in certain places uh, put up by the John Birch Society uh, in opposition to the civil rights and criminal law rulings of the Warren Court. And um, the billboards were up and uh, they were mostly in suburban and, and rural areas. But there were no congressional hearings or resolutions to pack the court or to limit jurisdiction or to limit terms. Now, all of those are being talked about and suggested even in the halls of Congress. So what's the difference? Is it, is it simply that uh, whose ox is being gored? Um, the, uh, there is an increased impact of court decisions on certain interests, the interest in abortion, in gun control, and in voter redistricting. So there's another difference also. Back in, in the 60s, the organized bar um, backed the Supreme Court in the 1960s because perhaps establishment inertia and because the court rulings uh, were progressive. Uh, but now the organized bar is reflected perhaps in the standing committee recommendations of the American Bar Association, is backing progressive changes against what is seen as a conservative um, court. There's an increased polit politicization of judicial selections. Candidates in the 1960s were very often totally apolitical. Uh, they were sometimes, especially in San Francisco, U.S. attorneys who became district court judges and then were promoted to the Ninth Circuit. Um, but the selection of judges, both on the left and on the right, has become uh, increasingly politicized. It's, um, it's very rare these days that you see a, a news report of a judicial decision by a federal judge without the tagline, he was a Obama, Bush, or, or Trump, or Biden appointee. Um, so, what are the changes that are being discussed? Term limits. I'm familiar with term limits because I was a Superior Court judge and ran an election uh, in San Francisco um, and then had to stand a couple more times. So, uh, I'm familiar with term limits and sometimes the psychological effects that term limits can have on judges and their decisions. Um, there's also quite a movement to limit the jurisdiction of federal courts, either by congressional action or by agency rulings, uh, saying that determinations of certain issues of fact should only be done by a certain uh, agency employee um, who is vested with discretion. And we'll discuss, I hope, what the term discretion means as far as judicial review. Um, the, um, there is also a great um, movement to recuse judges for their financial holdings. 
and in, indeed to limit the ability of judges to have certain financial holdings. Um, the, recently, the, the attacks on the judiciary have been somewhat highlighted by the, the murder of a New Jersey District Court judge and the increased security measures which the Federal Protective Services is uh, affording us. Um, however, uh, there was a recent report that the Federal Protective Service has been making recommendations on how to protect um, judges. And um, uh, this will be a great surprise to you, but of the recommendations, the agencies have implemented about 20%. Um, so the, um, there is legislation being moved to require agency reports when they turn down federal protective um, suggestions. At this point, I'd like to uh, introduce the panel members. I'm not going to introduce, I'm not going to read the complete curriculum vitae of each of them because that would then uh, take the, the whole period of uh, our discussion. Um, now, my immediate right is Ben Flowers, who is a partner of the firm of Ashbrook, Brin, and Kresge. Ben served as uh, Ohio's 10th Solicitor General, and he regularly rep represented the state of Ohio before the Supreme Court. Um, in, um, he's a graduate of uh, Ohio State University, and he clerked for Judge Sandra Akuda on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal and for Justice Antonin Scalia on the Supreme Court. Next to him is Professor Michael Ramsey. My, uh, professor Ramsey is a Hugh and Hazel Darling Foundation Professor of Law at the University of San Diego where he teaches and writes in the area of constitutional law. Um, prior to teaching, he served as a judicial clerk for Judge Clifford Wallace of the United States, of the Ninth Circuit, who just celebrated his 96th birthday and is going strong. Um, and he practiced uh, with a law firm of uh, Latham and Watkins. <clears throat> Next to him is Professor Eugene Volick of UCLA Law School. He teaches First Amendment Law and First Amendment Amicus Brief cl Clinic at UCLA Law School. And uh, he just told me that he's going to be moving to the Hoover Institute later this year. Uh, before coming to UCLA, he clerked for Judge Sandra Day O'Connor on the Supreme Court and just Judge Alice Kuczynski on the Court of Appeal. Next to him on his right is uh, Deborah Wong Yang, who is a partner of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher in Los Angeles office. She was the chair, she is the chair of the Crisis Management Group and the former chair of the White Collar Defense and Investigation Practice Group. The, business, the Los Angeles Business Journal named Ms. Yang at, to her annual list of 100 top lawyers in May 9, 2023. She was selected by uh, Mayor Antonio Villaragoza to serve on the Los Angeles Police Commissioner, part of the Civil, Civilian Oversight Committee of the LA Police Department. Ms. Yang received her Juris Doctor Award uh, degree from Boston College Law School and was a law clerk to uh, Judge Liu on the New York District Court for the Central District of California. So without further ado, we'll start off with the presentation. Each of the part, uh, panelists will speak for about five to seven minutes, and then we'll have questions um, that each will direct at the other on subjects that come up, and then we'll go to Q&A from the, uh, the uh, audience. So with further ado, Mr. Flowers. Thank you, Judge Bayer. Is this is on everybody here? Yeah. Um, now it's a privilege to be here. Thank you so much to the Federal Society for having me. Uh, Judge Bea, you actually uh, introduced, uh, you, you gave a, a talk to the clerks at the Ninth Circuit when I first began sort of introducing us in our orientation. So it's nice to be uh, introduced once again um, uh, by you and to be with you again. Um, my position on the, uh, the politics of the Supreme Court, uh, I think it w can be succinctly stated by just uh, uh, borrowing and altering a, a quote from actually one of Judge Bea's opinions, his dissent in Parents United, which is, uh, the way to stop being perceived as political is to stop being political. Now some of you will say that's Chief Justice Roberts in line. He said it too, but Judge Bea said it first and was not uh, cited in the opinion. Um, 
Now, I think the way to do that, and I think this may be a fairly popular view in this room, is originalism. Originalism assumes that there are right answers, that written word has fixed meaning, and that when, you, when a judge identifies that meaning, which, and, and their failure to do so can, can be tested. We can, there, there are right and wrong answers, even if there are hard questions, and uh, uh, hypotheses can be falsified. So it's, it is an objective approach to law that inherently, therefore, limits the uh, political nature of judging. We have the, the, certainly the most originalist court in, in the lifetimes of any living person. Uh, you have to go back to the 1800s or the 1700s to even have an argument, I think, that there was a more originalist court. And so for that reason, you have, uh, with a caveat I'll get into a, in a moment, a less political court than you've had uh, in any of our lifetimes. That doesn't mean that uh, the outside world would view it as apolitical. Um, the, the, the American people, much like clients, are, let's face it, ends driven. They, they care about the results more than the method. And so if they don't like the results, and in big cases, usually half the country won't, they'll, they'll dismiss the decision as political. But I think the only way the court can, um, can escape that accusation or can, can uh, at least limit the effects of that accusation is to just keep doing what it's doing, to explain its reasoning, to explain why the words mean what they mean, and to, to be incredibly dedicated to that, to that resolution. Uh, now, all that's a, what I said about originalism is true when you're dealing with issues of first impression. Uh, where I think things get a lot harder is where you have to deal with precedent, and this is an area where I think the Supreme Court has uh, frankly done a pretty bad job um, insulating itself from accusations of politics. Uh, and I'm talking in particular about stare decisis. Um, if you look at the way the court does stare decisis, with one exception, Justice Thomas, who I'll mention in a moment, it's kind of a multi-factor, throw everything in, see if you can come up, you know, look at reliance interests, look at how wrong was the decision. Was it really, really, really wrong, or was it only really, really wrong? Um, you know, anything else you can think of, and you just kind of throw all that in the pot, and you see what you come out with. Now, any competent lawyer, and, and uh, at least now that Justice Kennedy is retired, everyone on the Supreme Court is a competent lawyer. Uh, <laughs> any competent lawyer can take a multi-factor test and justify just about any outcome they would like to justify. And so the problem with the way the court does stare decisis is it sure starts to look a lot like, I'll keep the decisions I like, and I will get rid of the ones that I don't like. And that looks pretty political. So what's the solution to this? I think uh, it's to have a, a, a test rather than a standard, a rule rather than a standard for when the court overrules uh, precedent. Now one option is to just have absolute stare decisis. You never overrule a precedent. I, I don't think anyone in history has ever had that view. I don't think it's a good view. So we can put that one off to the side. One other option that's out there, and it's Justice Thomas's, is to say that it's to treat stare decisis not as a mandate to preserve precedent, but rather as a reminder that we should all be intellectually humble. Uh, we should not assume that just because we read the text and think it means something, that 200 years of judges resolving it in a different way must have all been incorrect. Um, and so courts should be humble, they should approach uh, when there's a settled precedent, they should be cautious before they overrule it. But if they do the research, they do the work, and they determine that a precedent is demonstrably incorrect, can't be defended as an original matter, uh, then they are duty-bound to overrule it, at least when the parties ask them to overrule it. And I think introducing that sort of rule-based approach to stare decisis would limit uh, what looks like political decision-making in one area where the court is particularly prone to be accused of engaging in politics. Think about Dobbs overruling Roe, uh, or the Heller decision, which didn't overrule anything but made new law. I think if you can explain that when, the, when there are precedents uh, out there, the reason we're not following them is because we are duty-bound in every single case to get rid of the ones that are demonstrably incorrect, it will be much easier to defend uh, the decision against accusations of politics rather than just pointing to nine factors and saying that the balance came out uh, one way or the other. I think at that point I'm content to stop and hand it off to my, my colleagues on the panel. Michael? All right, thanks very much. Thanks for that. And uh, I wanted to speak uh, mostly from the perspective of someone who was uh, one of the token conservatives on uh, President Biden's uh, presidential commission on the Supreme Court. Um, I was also one of only two West Coast members on that uh, commission, so I was a double minority. And my colleague from the West Coast was a liberal law professor from Berkeley. Uh, but uh, so it, uh, that gave me an opportunity to see 
uh, most, of the, uh, the, most of the experience was seeing a number of uh, left-leaning law professors and commentators complain about the Supreme Court. Uh, and so that gave me some perspective, perhaps, on, uh, on the question we have today. So I want to make uh, four points quickly. Uh, the, the first is when, I think when the, court, the courts uh, involve themselves in political and moral decisions of great importance to the society, uh, then necessarily they're going to be viewed politically uh, to the extent that they intervene against uh, the, uh, the political branches. Uh, I think that's just a, sort of an inevitable outgrowth. Uh, it is indeed something that Justice Scalia warned about uh, back in the 1990s in his, his book, uh, Matter of Interpretation. Uh, and it came out quite strongly on the commission because um, most of the criticism of the court uh, was uh, directly or indirectly, uh, we don't like the results we're getting. Uh, we're not getting the results we want, and even worse, you're getting, you conservatives are getting, results that you want. Uh, and that's what's wrong with the court. Uh, now, I think, second point, a, an obvious solution to the politicization of the court uh, is for the court to do less uh, intervening in matters of significant uh, moral and uh, political importance, uh, to adopt a strong view of judicial restraint, which was actually, after all, the original inspiration uh, of originalism and uh, countering the Warren Court, uh, the idea of judicial restraint. The courts are not well suited uh, to make important political and moral decisions. Uh, the problem with this solution is it's entirely impractical because it has no material cons constituency on either side of the aisle. Uh, conservatives like getting results out of the court now that they're getting results out of the court, uh, and uh, the left is not at all interested uh, in uh, a compromise that would remove courts from the, uh, the center of politics. Um, this, again, was quite clear from the commission. That's what the commission, what the uh, liberals on the commission wanted, um, was their results, not a uh, reduction of the court's uh, influence. Uh, and if you doubt that, just consider uh, that the number one criticism of the court from the left is the current court, is that the current court returned the issue of abortion to the political branches. And the number one desire that they want out of the current courts currently uh, is for the courts to disqualify the leading presidential candidate of one political party. Uh, this is not an agenda of judicial restraint. So conservatives would be foolish uh, to pursue a, a, a philosophy of judicial restraint as a compromise until the other side shows any interest in compromise. Um, third point, uh, on the commission we specifically were charged with considering various re institutional reforms for the court. Uh, our report goes on at uh, considerable length, but I recommend it to you. I think it's quite a good report. I think it illustrates some of the practical problems. Uh, with, uh, with those reforms. But I will say as well uh, that it seemed to me that all of the reforms were inspired directly or indirectly by a desire to change the political orientation of the court. That is, they were motivated not by institutional concerns at bottom, but political concerns. Uh, for example, the idea of, uh, of increasing the size of the court uh, well, that's just, we're going to get some more of our guys on the court so they can outvote your guys. And uh, the idea of uh, term limits, uh, although I think there's something to be said for term limits sort of in theory, that in the current political environment, term limits seems transparently to be, we want to get your guys off the court uh, so we can put our guys on. So uh, my... Well, Bottom line takeaway from the commission was that there actually is not an institutional problem uh, with our courts, and particularly with the Supreme Court. Um, it, it is rather uh, a political problem with the role that the courts have taken for themselves and, and the understandable reaction uh, from the politicians and the people uh, to courts taking that role. Now, my fourth point, uh, which is in the nature of what is to be done, uh, and, and here I'm, I'm going to largely uh, agree with Ben that uh, the, the first cut at this is to say, uh, and here again I'm, I'm uh, channeling Justice Scalia, that the, the solution to politicization of the courts uh, is for courts to pursue originalism and textualism uh, so that they are bound into an objective meaning of the, of the uh, law and can, they can uh, therefore deflect the criticism to some extent, that 
what they're doing is just imposing their own uh, moral and political intuitions. I think there's a problem with that, uh, which is that the other side's not going to buy it. They don't think that originalism is neutral, and they don't think that originalism is being applied neutrally by courts. Uh, and the people as, the whole, as a whole will be skeptical to the extent that they're not getting the results that they like. Nonetheless, I'm unable to think of any better solution. Uh, let me offer two quick sort of subparts to that and, and conclude there. Uh, the first is, I think that there's much to be said for pursuing uh, originalist and textualist results um, that, sorry, originalist and, and textualist conclusions that lead to outcomes favored by the left. Uh, the reason for this is it illustrates a, a neutrality of originalism. And Justice Scalia was very interested in this, uh, and it allowed him to deflect some of the criticism uh, of his jurisprudence. For example, he was known uh, for reaching uh, more liberal results in some criminal and criminal procedure cases. Uh, and he was very proud of those, uh, and he thought that those uh, illustrated the neutrality of originalism. So my pitch is um, that judges should aggressively consider uh, the possibility that originalism and textualism can lead to liberal results, and that we as an audience uh, for judicial opinions should applaud uh, rather than criticize when that happens legitimately. You want to have no idea. I don't, I'm not suggesting that they should uh, do it artificially or incorrectly, but when it happens, it's, uh, it's something to be applauded. And then the second point is, I would say that uh, originalism can be, although not uh, purely restrained, you know, not, not comprehensively restrained, uh, in terms of the judge's role. But original can be restrained in the sense that um, when the Constitution's text and original meaning are sometimes unclear, uh, often unclear. Uh, and when they are, I think that courts can legitimately say the Constitution is unclear and therefore we, the court, have no basis for interfering against the political branches. Uh, we will step back because the Constitution does not give us a clear command. So that's, that's the second Kind of version of originalism that, that I would urge on, on courts and, and uh, perhaps presumptive of me to urge anything on courts, but I would urge on, on the audience, uh, uh, on you all, and my fellow professors, people who uh, uh, study and, and criticize the court, um, that emphasizing those two aspects of originalism I think will help uh, in toning down the uh, politicism, politicization of the courts that we've been seeing. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Paul. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is an interesting and important question, tremendously important. I'm not sure. In fact, I'm pretty sure I have no answer. I have a few observations, which in some measure uh, match what, uh, what people are saying here. Uh, one, one is uh, judges are government officials who are exercising government power. In a democracy, it's unsurprising that many in the public would disapprove of particular exercises of such power. They may disapprove of them for ways that we, in, for reasons that we as lawyers think are unsound. Like they just don't like the result. They haven't read the statute. They haven't read the the, the, the historical evidence. They haven't read the precedents. But that's what we as lawyers say. They as citizens are going to have views and are going to criticize the court and are going to criticize them for political reasons. But again, that's because they are citizens of a democracy. And unsurprisingly, government officials are going to be criticized for political reasons. So, so some amount of such criticism is, is inevitable, I think. It may ebb and flow depending on various factors. Uh, uh, probably the chief factor is just how, how prominent, how high profile the decisions are, uh, or maybe not how high profile, how salient they are to the public. If the decisions are mostly about complicated technical schemes, maybe the public will just be too bored to criticize. Uh, uh, but, but for certain topics, of course, uh, people will, uh, will fault the court for political reasons. A second thing is, at least the way that we have set up our constitutional structure, it is inevitable that judges are going to make decisions that I think are not dictated by neutral principles in the sense of text or original meaning. Um, and uh, it's inevitable, at least, 
again, given our current constitutional structure and constitutional traditions. Uh, you know, I, I'm not an originalist. I've done some originalist research. I respect originalist arguments. I will say on certain subjects, on many subjects, including in the area I most study, which is free speech law, there's actually very little original uh, meaning evidence to guide virtually any modern First, First Amendment decisions. You might say New York Times v. Sullivan was wrong as a matter of original meaning. That may in fact be correct. Uh, but you go beyond that, you go to virtually every case that uh, the court has been deciding recently, 303 Creative, um, or uh, uh, cases having to do with campaign finance law, uh, or you know, pretty much anything, content-based sign regulations. I've looked at a lot of original meaning evidence about free speech. I can't really say that there's any real evidence one way or the other on the subject. This is an area where, in order for there to be meaningful for free speech law, courts really have to construct doctrine. Uh, maybe informed by what they understand to be big picture um, uh, originalist principles or textualist principles, uh, but only at a very loose level. At some point, judges are going to have to make discretionary decisions about how to set up various doctrinal rules, and unsurprisingly, that's going to be controlled. Um, uh, the other problem is that whatever one might think of as originalism as a matter of political morality or as a matter of kind of sound legal reasoning, I just think it has only very limited, um, uh, very limited uh, uh, credibility with the public as a whole, partly because indeed people want results, that's what they care about, not, not so much methods. They like the appeal of neutral principles, but the fact is that, uh, just to take an example that I've written about, that I actually support the court's current decisions, gun policy and gun control laws, right to keep and bear arms. It is a strange thing that our current policy on the regulation of guns is influenced by the judgment of a bunch of people 230 years ago. And some people say, well, yes, and they were all men, and they were all white, and they were all property. I don't think it matters really that much. It's none of them were us. All of them were radically different. The way in which they were most different from us is they were people of this 18th century. Um, and uh, uh, it's unsurprising that a lot of people might say, look, I don't really care so much what they uh, what, uh, what the original meaning is. I care about what makes sense today. Uh, um, uh, and uh, some people don't actually articulate it quite that way. Some people nod to, uh, to the written constitution. At least they see the appeal of following the constitutional text. Because as I think we'll vote has argued, it's just our law until it's changed and it hasn't been changed. But I think deep down inside for many people, if there's any ambiguity, they're just going to want to interpret it uh, in light of, what's, uh, of, uh, of, of what they think is right. And now, I'm not saying that that position is correct or ultimately healthy for a legal system, or in particular for our legal system, given its traditions of constitutionalism and attention to text. And it may be that if you care about text, then you need to care about original meaning, because if the only reason the text is binding is because it was law enacted at a particular time, we should pay attention to what it was understood to mean at a particular time. So those are all perfectly plausible arguments in favor of originalism. It's just, again, that maybe they have a very limited constituency, possibly covering people in this room or, well, other people in other similar rooms. Um, and uh, uh, then, of course, the support for originalism will simply ebb and flow among the public, if my conjecture is correct. Uh, based on whether the public likes the results. So I suppose one question might be um, uh, what, what we should, just like what, what level of political uh, controversy we should expect, and maybe the answer should be pretty high. It is, of course, extraordinarily un, uh, bad when uh, that controversy turns into violent attacks on the judiciary. Although the, the attacks, I think, on judges have historically been mostly, the physical attacks have been mostly, as I understand it, just either crazies or people who are just upset with, with things that happened to them in the, in the litigation system. But, but not entirely, obviously. There was the attempted assassination or 
uh, of uh, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, at least the, the potential attempt at assassination. But, uh, um, uh, but uh, uh, th that's obviously something we want to try to see if anything can be done about it. But uh, beyond that, some level of political disagreement with the court and political criticism, and criticism that is therefore that is unfair by the standards of those of us in the room, or even by the standards of lawyers generally, is going to be inevitable. Then there's the question, of course, of what, of at least even if criticism is unfair, judges ought to try to make sure they deserve as little uh, of it as possible. And that relates to some of these questions. I do think that the argument about precedent, I think, uh, uh, that, that uh, um, was identified is, is extremely important. That so long as you have discretionary judgments about which, original, which precedents are to be overruled for originalist reasons and which are not, then the constraining power of originalism uh, again, the notion that judges should deserve respect because they're not just making it up, they're not just following their own preferences, uh, becomes a, a lot weaker. Again, though, as a practical matter, I wonder how the system would end up working uh, if indeed virtually everything was constantly up for grabs. There are, there are important institutional reasons for, uh, for precedent. Uh, and if we had a court of nine Justice Thomases, it may be very good in various ways, but I wonder, I wonder how it would deal with, uh, with um, uh, the, a situation where everything could be revised if you only came up with a, with a new historical argument. So I think those are important points. Again, we should, we should try to urge courts to do the right thing, and judges should try to do the right thing apart from public sentiment. Uh, except when public sentiment is in fact legally relevant in various uh, various ways, but um, uh, I, I just don't see I just don't see much uh, of much hope that this is going to yield some degree of public uh, of greater public support for the, for the court through any means other than the court just doing what the public wants. That uh, and that's that's something that again as a legal matter is not what we particularly care for. Great, thank you. Um, note to self, don't speak after three esteemed speakers on a Saturday morning. Um, let me offer you a few thoughts, but before I do that, because I do have a very different background from our other speakers, let me just sort of give that to you so you have, know where I'm coming from. I'm a former state court, California state court judge. I sat there for a period of five years. I also was the United States attorney here for the Central District of California right after 9-11 um, and worked very closely with um, Attorney General Ashcroft in fashioning all the responses that we had, including Guantanamo, FISA, things of that sort. Um, I then actually went through, again, you have to wonder how sane I am to sign up to go through the Senate Judiciary a second time, um, but I went through it again um, in a run-up to the Ninth Circuit, um, which I made it all the way through, but for other reasons I decided to pull my name out and part of that was because um, I had decided at that point that I wanted to keep my, my voice uh, and be an advocate in my community. Um, and so I stepped out of that process. But so I've seen that, I've lived in that, um, and I offer you some thoughts from that perspective. I think what we're seeing right now with the politis politicization of the courts is the fact that things are not getting resolved outside of the courts. Um, and so there's so much that, so many topical things that are being driven. And you know, while we've talked about lofty things that hit you know, the Supreme Court, there are so many other kinds of things that govern all the everyday you know, things in which we live our lives um, and things that affect all Americans that is really sort of being um, besieged on the courts in a way that I don't think that they've ever anticipated or were prepared for. I think what that's done is that's left a lot of judges in isolation. And I want to talk to you about that for a second because, you know, um, this, this seems like the appropriate format. But let me give you just a quick example and bear with me. When I was the United States Attorney, I was doing an investigation that some people didn't like. And it was a big investigation. It was into a foreign country. And part of the mechanism of defense counsel, and now I am defense counsel, so I can see everything that everybody was doing, right? But when I was, when what happened was they opened up 
they made a report of wrongful conduct by the prosecutor, and it started a process called, you know, an OPR investigation. And what that does, and what they knew it would do, is it would stymie the investigation for a period of years, um, where they could, you know, try to uh, make other attacks on why this case shouldn't go forward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, including reaching out to, at the time, Defense Secretary Colin Powell. So just to tell you at the level of which we're dealing with. But what happens internally, because there's an analogy to judges, is prosecutors don't have, you can't, there's no Office of General Counsel. There's no, oh, well, can you go protect me on this while I actually focus on the case? And so the diversion and the attack on prosecutors turns into exactly that. It diverts them from exactly what they're doing. It leaves them in a place where they're personally vulnerable and where they personally have no way to defend themselves. And it's a, I'll call it a move. It's a move that you do on the government to slow them down, okay? I see that now happening to the bench, right? And uh, take, for example, what happened with Justice Thomas and the Harlan Crow situation, right? So what happens there? ProPublica is in receipt of IRS information that is private, stolen, but yet because they're, you know, because of how we are in the United States, they get to keep that information. And who's the, like, who's one of the first people that they focus on? Justice Thomas, right? And I dare say that the judges on a personal level and even on a professional staff level are prepared or ready for that kind of onslaught. You know, you're just, as a jurist, you're not used to being thrown out into the media every single day. You know, you're not used to having, you know, you make wise decisions that are vetted, that are thought through, that are, you know, work with all law clerks that you work with, right? Um, and you come to decisions, and now you're sort of cast about in this other world where you're bandied about, you're joked about, you're in, you're in cartoons, um, and it's very demeaning to the position, it's very demeaning to the jurist. But more importantly, there's no way for them to defend themselves, there's no mechanism. For Fortunately, you know, in this situation, Harlan Crow was an outsider and he was able to, you know, um, to speak to some of those issues to the extent that he felt comfortable. But I think it highlights what's going on and what is continuing to go on when people are unhappy and the level of assault that um, others are willing to engage in to detract from that jurors being able to do the things that they're doing. So I throw out to you, you know, the, the notion that lawyers um, need to do something and need to gather around some of these jurists and some of these judges that get attacked like that to provide some sort of counter voice. Some, it's not appropriate for a judge to be speaking about these things, so they're silent. So as you guys know in today's media, it's like an onslaught of noise coming from one side and absolutely nothing coming from the other side. And so it just starts to become this echo chamber. And so there needs to be, I suggest to you, a voice in there that actually is advocating on behalf of what the jurist is doing, you know, or defending the rule of law, or defending the bench, or defending the court system in that same kind of way. And I think that, you know, if you look at the ABA model rules, they provide for that. The lawyers are supposed to actually protect the judiciary and be involved in that. And I think we should think about that because otherwise, I see this sort of path where it's just going to continue that way and it has a lot of re repercussions. It has, it does have a psychological effect on the jurors. You know, when you're thinking about the decisions that you make, you know, it's hard enough to make those decisions within the confines of the case itself and then trying to understand the manifestations of that case as it may go slightly beyond that. But to have to factor in or you don't want them to factor in, you know, when you're thinking about stare decisis, but we're human, right? And so you can't help but know that it's going to have some other kind of attack, that you have to notify judicial security, that you have to order more bailiffs into the courtroom that day, that you have to watch yourself when you go to the garage, that you can't drive home the route that you normally drive home because Unfortunately, the marshals don't provide and federal protective service don't provide much service at all. It has to be a, quote, viable threat. So when you're under assault like that, it's really hard to be your best mental purist. Um, and I suggest to you that I think that, that they need that kind of support and that's something that we should think about. 
The notion of term limits and the notion of changing the number of jurors, to me, is exactly the same kind of thing. It's just dovetailing into exactly the same issue. Um, and for whatever reasons, but the notion of term limits, um, and I, I recognize that there are some, you know, some who advocate for that, some who advocate against that, and that that percentage has changed and it's more in the middle these days. But I suggest to you that with respect to term limits, aside from the issue of aging and um, not being uh, able to make the kinds of, uh, carry the kind of load that the judges carry today, that's a different issue in my mind and I put that aside for a second. Um, but putting that issue aside, I think that the notion of term limits, of having somebody, you know, you're asking people to leave what is now in the legal world um, for these highly qualified individuals, a very lucrative market, right? So they're stepping away from that and they're going into this other world of being on the judiciary. There's a lot of personal sacrifice that goes into that. But with that, there's that notion of this is, this is an exalted position in the United States, in the world, that it's one of great honor and it's one of great respect. And I think when you start to erode that a little bit, you know, and I keep thinking about what if I were, you know, what if, what if any of us were on the bench and we're 68 years old, and I have Ted Olson as one of my partners, Ted Olson is still practicing, and I'm not going to say his age, but Ted Olson is still practicing, right? Um, but, you know, if you're 68 and all of a sudden you just turned out, what does that do practically, right? Because you can actually, you know, with good health, you know, for all of us, you can actually go on and have another job. So do you go back into the private sector? Do you, as a former, you know, Supreme Court justice, have to start marketing yourself? Do you have to start convincing people that you're the, you're the guy or the woman that they should hire? It seems very unbecoming to me, given the kind of um, exalted position that it is and the way that we hold and regard that here in the United States. Um, you put them in a position where now they actually practically may have to earn a living. And so, you know, I see this happening with state court judges who go into mediations and arbitrations. All of a sudden, they're, I, I call it the decloaking. Um, and they're at the mercy of, you know, of the market, so to speak. Um, and I don't think it's a, um, it's a becoming look, and I don't think that it's one that we want for, you know, our highest level of jurists in this country. Um, so that's something to think about. There's also that notion of if you put in something like term limits and that's not, you know, something that you're going to be able to run with for the rest of your life, I think we're going to not get the kind of uh, people to apply that we have been because the job will become that, that less attractive. So anyway, thank you for um, bearing with me. It's something, you know, I care deeply about when I see the attacks on the judges. I know that they're not getting the kind of protection that they should. And I tell you that because when I used to have to go into gang-infested territories here in Los Angeles, the city attorney had an entourage of law enforcement with them. The DA had five or six black cars with them. I drove my Sienna minivan. And they used to say to me, Deb, what are you doing? How can you do this? This is unsafe for you to be here. You're a walking target. And I would tell the marshals and they would tell me, unless there's an actual threat made, we can't activate. So just so you understand the level that it takes before you actually get that protection, it's, it's I would dare say, it's not there in the way that we would like it to be. So thank you. Thank you. Now we're gonna uh, open the uh, panel to ask each other questions comment on what they've said, but in my position as running the show, I'm going to start. So let me put this to Ben Flowers and Michael Ramsey. When you use originalism to supplant politics, aren't you really choosing a political flavor? Because, for instance, in gun control, if you're going to use the historical and traditional regulations that obtained in 1791, there were very few that obtained. Originalism, textualism, 
seem to hark back to an era when there was less government control over every portion of our lives. And when there's less government control, isn't that a form of politics called conservatism? Uh, it's a good question. I think I'll, I'll start with uh, by stealing a story or a joke, I guess, that Justice Scalia would repeat all the time, which is he would uh, talk about two hunters in Alaska, uh, and all of a sudden a, a Kodiak bear starts chasing after them, and the one uh, bends down to tie his shoes, and the other says, what are you doing? We have to, this bear chasing us. Why are you tying your shoes? And he says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I have to outrun you. <laughs> and uh, that's my position as an originalist, too. Uh, and that was the moral of the story, is uh, the ori originalists don't have to show that the theory is perfect or that it will yield easy answers or that it is uh, going to completely free the judges from anything that can even look political. Uh, what we have to do is show that it works better than anything else. And I frankly haven't seen anything better uh, that, that, that does a better job of that um, than originalism. Um, and now to be clear, originalism, people can do originalism badly. Uh, and judges can do originalism badly. And they can reach incorrect uh, results. Um, you know, there's plenty of fair room to argue about the original meaning of the Second Amendment and to what extent do we require a precise analog from the founding era. Uh, for those interested, I thought the briefing in the Bruin case uh, the SG's brief and the, the briefs on the other side all did a good job of zooming in, zooming out to try to find the right level of generality. And those are tough questions. Um, but I, I don't think it requires choosing conservatism um, because even if that's sort of what, if you're choosing something like that in the Second Amendment context, there will be other contexts, like Professor Ramsey noted, like the, like the Confrontation Clause, like the Fourth Amendment, uh, where you'll um, obtain results that, for lack of a better term, are more liberal or progressive. Uh, they were more favorable to the criminal defendant than we've had uh, over in, in parts of the 20th century, at least. Uh, so I don't, I think originalism is neutral in that sense, is that honestly applied, you'll sometimes get results that look conservative, and you'll sometimes get results that look uh, liberal. And if it's done correctly, it really should look that way, I think. Uh, yeah, well, I, that's a great question, and uh, I, and I think I largely agree with the with the answer uh, that you just heard, uh, but let me uh, sort of take a, a little bit different perspective on it in, in the sense, that, and this is to some extent I think a, a response to some of the uh, remarks that Professor Falk said as well, uh, that I think if, if you look at it from so what, what should conservatives favor, uh, so the, the alternative is, and this is a, an important debate within conservative circles right now, uh, is originalism the right conservative? Principle, or uh, should instead conservatives embrace the idea of, of politicized judging, by which I mean uh, judging uh, based on the, the uh, social and moral intuitions of the judges. Uh, and there, there is a movement uh, among particularly, I think, younger conservatives that says, I don't know, originalism doesn't seem to be always getting us where we want to be, uh, and why not? Uh, adopt the view that uh, it is all inherently political. Uh, and I think there is something to be said for that. Uh, I can see why people take that view. Uh, and if you're very skeptical about the um, appeal of originalism to sort of uh, independent uh, voters, independent uh, politically minded people, uh, then I can see that that might be the thing to do. You say, well, people on the left are doing it, so why shouldn't we do it? Uh, but, but I retain uh, some faith uh, that there is an appeal to uh, a neutral principle uh, of following the text given its original meaning. Um, people on the left are not going to accept it, but uh, I think it's, it's an argument that we can make uh, for the neutrality of judges and may not be entirely uh, accepted, uh, but it might be um, at the margins, uh, and that's where politics is the most important, uh, it may uh, carry some force. Now, is, is there something sort of inherently conservative about originalism? Uh, is it, I, think, I think Judge Bay is right that um, it's, it's not so much inherently conservative, but what it, it is inherently limiting of government. Uh, and, and that shouldn't be surprising because uh, that, that was what our Constitution was about, was to limit government. 
Uh, some constitutions aren't like that, but that's fundamentally what our constitution is like, is, is to, to limit government, uh, to make it, make it hard to pass laws, to um, impose rights that would, that would be superior to law and so forth. Um, is that a conservative thing? Well, it's a conservative thing when conservatives don't want the law, and it's not a conservative thing when they do want laws. Uh, so in that sense, I do actually think it's, uh, um, it's more neutral uh, than just a, 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 a political principle that flows directly from modern politics. Um, it's a political philosophy, um, but it cashes out uh, in different ways with respect to particular issues today. And for that reason, I think it's, it's more neutral than simply saying uh, what we're going to do is, impose, is, is adopt conservative political principles of the moment. Can so, I add one more thing? Go ahead. And this goes to uh, Deborah's remarks, which I, which I really uh, thought were fantastic about the bar standing up for the courts. Uh, I think in terms of showing that the, the way court, whether they're originalists or not, the way judges are doing laws is law and not policy, the bar has done a woefully inadequate job of speaking out uh, and explaining that to the general public. Yeah, when I, everyone who's clerked, everyone who's litigated has had some case where they, are, what, they can be either very confident or 100% certain that the judge is reaching a resolution that they personally do not like, but think the law, whether it's precedent or text or whatever else, compels them to reach. And it's, it's very disappointing to me that with these attacks on the court, you have this elite Supreme Court bar, you have other lawyers around the country who just stay quiet and don't say that. And it's very puzzling to me because I know that they know that the judges there are not simply enacting their policy preferences, uh, but they're disinclined to say it. And I think we, as lawyers, need to be out there speaking about that more. So you, the, there are many constitutions, of course, in the US, 51 at least. Um, and uh, for 50 of them, in the state level, they're fairly easy to change compared to the federal constitution. Now, uh, I don't have an exact count, but I, my sense is that in many states, originalist methods with regard to the state constitution have long been accepted, at least in considerable measure. At least there's not a huge debate about it at the federal level. Now, uh, whether they're always adhered to or not, it's harder to tell. Uh, and there is the question of precedent, which of course state judges also take very seriously. Uh, but uh, but the, the notion that, well, you know, when we interpret the Oregon Constitution, we need to see what the Oregon framers thought of was the meaning of this, or that maybe not the Oregon framers, but people of that era interpreting it, sort of the original intent, original meaning debate. I think there's a lot of such authority, but you can change the constitutions often with majority vote. Uh, of the public, maybe some supermajority in the state legislature. So the result is that the constitutions get amended pretty often, and the constitution is a, is something that the that at least the public knows if if it's out of step with our sentiments, we can get it changed. So part of the problem, I think, this relates to Judge Judge Bay's point is. Whether you call the Constitution a conservative document because it comes goes back a, a origin, original meaning of it, a conservative meaning because it harkens back to a time when there was smaller government, or whether you conclude well, so in certain matters it's more liberal than today because it protects individual rights more. The bottom line is, in many many ways, it is a document that is of a very very different time with very different problems, and that unsurprisingly, whatever you call that ideology of the framers, it's not the ideology of many people today. And so one question is, and maybe the answer is there's nothing to be done about it, uh, at least through originalist tools as opposed to through just appointing judges who will just impose their own views on the subject, but maybe part of the problem is the Constitution is too hard to amend. That when you have to have the kind of national supermajority that would yield two-thirds votes in Congress or petitions from two-thirds of the states and then three-quarters support from state legislatures, that's something that guarantees that the Constitution will be very much out of step with the times. Now, sometimes we may want it to be a bit out of step with the times because, you know, you want it to overcome the passions of the moment, but do you want it to be 230 years out of step with the time and growing, right? 
Um, so, so I do think that there, there is this problem that, that if you really go with originalism, honestly go with originalism, it does impose at the very least an ideology on the public, whether you call it liberal or conservative, that's unsurprisingly going to be very different from the views of many people and sometimes majorities. And then the question is, what do you do about it? Do you say, well, that's the way it is, and it's really important to have it be very hard to amend, and we'll stick with it? Or is the answer either to change the amendment process or accept the reality that the amendment will happen through the justices? Yeah, and let me just add a quick point um, and, and thought. Um, you know, it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect answer, as the, excuse me, as the professor just um, identified, um, and nor is there an easy solution. But one of the things about having originalism and sort of a construct from which we all work is that it does keep, in my mind, far off and wayward things from, from sort of coming in. And there's an element of, um, I think, good things that come of that. It's that sense of some continuity, some predictability, um, some understanding of where the law is without some jagged change to it, um, at least coming from the judiciary. And the thing is, is that I counsel a lot of businesses. Um, we have a lot of tech businesses here in California. It, we're always looking at things around the corner going forward, you know, projections about what might happen and things like that. And as American businesses build themselves out, they want to know what that landscape ahead of them looks like. And so with that, that sense of, you know, um, continuity, it gives them some comfort in making business decisions. And so, um, without talking about the politics of it, I, what, what is helpful is having some of that continuity because it prevents a complete disruption. It allows them to, you know, um, if you talk to anybody that, you, that knows me, they'll tell you all I want is for American businesses to succeed. That is my number one thing. And that and, and perhaps militarily, but putting that aside. Um, but, you know, we want to give them that continuity so that they can go out and compete on the international front. And so having that sense of stare decisis and doing that analysis allows them to at least see in areas where it's been untested, right? Because we have technology now in a way that we didn't before and it's upending a few things and it's testing um, certain constant rules of law that we've always had because the application is so different. Um, and so I think having that without having um, the additional um, volatility to it, that there's something um, beneficial to that. All right, and I'd like to open the floor to uh, any of the participants asking questions of the others as to any points that they'd like. Mary, I, I, I thought I might make just a real uh, quick response to Professor Roth on, on, the, on his last point that... Shall we go on a first name basis? <laughs> <I> think we... <laughs> that We're all friends here. We're all colleagues. Eugene. Okay. Eugene, you say, and I think there's a lot of force to this, that the Constitution is old, um, it doesn't uh, reflect modern concerns. Um, why isn't the uh, conclusion from that, which I think there is some truth to that, certainly, uh, why isn't the conclusion to that then um, that the court should just step back from political debates? And isn't that an argument for a, a strong version of uh, judicial restraint? Um, because um, the, 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 the alternative you seem to posit is that judges are going to be the ones that decide what the new values and the new circumstances what rules are called for by the new values and the new circumstances. Um, but why should that task devolve to unelected judges? Why isn't that simply saying, well, we, if the Constitution is old and outdated, we should just, just have the Constitution, and we should, we should let the political branches resolve this? You know, so I think that's a great argument. I think we all agree that that's not an originalist argument. That was sort of your supplement to originalism, that if the original meaning is not clear, then you might have it well, majoritarianism. Right, right, but I'm just, I'm just saying, if, if, you, if we're not going to be originalists, mm -hmm. yeah, I am, I am positing it as, the, as an alternative to originalism. If we're not going to be originalists because we think the Constitution is, uh, is old and outdated, 
Why then is not the, uh, the, the natural uh, alternative to originalism? Just simply not have a strong constitutional regime. Right, and just sort of have a system like which England, I'm not sure it still fully does, but at least used to have, which is Parliament is supreme, and you know, Parliament is expected to follow the Constitution, which is a set of particular traditions that constitute, that make up the, the legal system and the governmental system, but if it wants to change them, it can change them. Um, and, uh, uh, that, you know, I think that's a very plausible system. Again, it's not the system we have. And getting to it, it sounds to me, will be very difficult. I mean, one way of thinking about it is, if there probably was something of a constituency for this on the court, Justice Rehnquist. My sense is if you had to look at someone who was relatively sort of in favor of deferring to elected branches, it was Rehnquist. And, uh, and even he, later in his, in his career, was willing to, uh, to read some constitutional provisions as more constraining. Uh, but in any event, it just didn't really draw that many people. Uh, Judge Bork probably would have would have been in that camp as well. I think while originalist, he was also in many ways a, a majoritarian. But look what happened there, right? <laughs> and if you think about it, the the, cons the liberal movement was certainly not on board with that. The conservative movement, following Rehnquist or after Rehnquist was appointed to the court, was if anything somewhat. Uh, uh, didn't uh, overtly repudiate, but the people we remember, uh, obviously Scalia and Thomas from that era, Justice Kennedy, maybe less less of a conservative, but still also very much in this mold, were very big on saying, well, there are important provisions of the Constitution that we are going to enforce. Majority majority will is, is, can can overcome that. So I think, in principle, that might be a sound. Uh, a, a sound approach, and obviously, as I said, at least one civilized country has tried it and has succeeded with it. It just doesn't seem to be on the table. Uh, all right, I look at the clock, and I think it's time to open the uh, question and answer period. Uh, do we have someone with microphone that can? All right, come on up. Please. Can I ask Eugene one provocative question? Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> provoke me. Uh, so one. I think one way you can imagine the system pretty easily embracing that approach would be to say, um, let's rethink incorporation of the Bill of Rights. Because if you didn't have that, you go back to your 50 state constitutions, the states would have significantly more leeway yeah. to regulate without the federal government getting involved. You could make an argument that we don't, okay, first to be clear, I believe the 14th Amendment actually does incorporate the right. Bill of Rights, I don't think that's wrong. Uh, and I think it's also pretty clear that it was necessary at the time of the Civil War, given the behavior in right. the former Confederacy. But one can imagine an argument that uh, the states are more well-behaved now. We can trust them to <laughs> regulate themselves better. And by doing so, we would take the federal courts completely out of quite a few political debates. Right. So that's A. It, um, uh, uh, if we do that, that will get courts out of quite a few political debates. B. It is indeed a self-conscious retreat from originalism. Not that that's necessarily wrong, but just important to recognize that. Well, I was thinking through a constitutional amendment. Oh, through a constitutional true. amendment? Fine, fine, fine. Uh, again, so then actually that makes my C much easier. <laughs> Maybe the states where majorities are going to really endorse that, especially given that change is always difficult. I think people are always more hesitant to lose things uh, uh, the, the prospect of loss is more salient to them than, than the hope of gain. So the liberal states, obviously, liberal majority states, won't much care for that because there are various liberal rights that they would see being protected and would like more protected. Conservative states, oh, well, you know, that just means there goes the right to bear arms. There goes, there goes protection against, uh, against uh, various kinds of restrictions on conservative speech. There goes protection for religious freedom. Now, if there are going to be people, or states in which the majority really are big believers in states' rights, or big believers in localism more broadly, who say, yeah, you know, I don't actually much care what happens in other states. Let them do their own thing. I love it because that means that, I don't know, Coloradans can decide what happens for Coloradans. You know, that, 
then those might be might be counting towards those three quarters. But my sense is that maybe this might have been possible in the past at some points. But in America today, very few Coloradans really think of themselves as Coloradans for, uh, uh, first and foremost, or have tremendous trust in their in their state legislatures. Uh, so, so my, I, I just don't see that as a, as a politically viable option in America of today. Maybe if we're talking about what would be the optimal system generally, I, there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, it just, it just, I just don't think it's politically available. Thank you. All right, let's uh, have our, who's got asking questions? I've got a question. Right. Would you please state your name and then direct your question to one of the panelists? My name is Drew Forster, and my question is for uh, Professor Wallach. You mentioned, uh, I think you've got a great sense of the consensus right now, and my question is, what place does the rhetorical argument that legislatures can step up to the plate and they need to take their role more seriously and do a lot of the things that the public is asking the courts to do right now, uh, does that have any place in the rhetoric right now? How convincing is that argument? I thought that Ms. Wong might uh, allude, to the, allude to that a little bit in the beginning of her remarks, but is that convincing enough to stay ahead of the bear? I'm sorry, can, can you give a concrete example of where you think the problem is legislatures aren't, aren't taking enough steps? I mean, I'm not saying that that's impossible. I'm just wondering what exactly uh, you have in mind. I don't have a specific example in current, uh, in current disputes. Um, on a leadership level, when it comes to potentially modifying the Constitution, like you mentioned, the national legislature certainly, they would have a role rhetorically in advocating that. I know the state legislature is the one that actually um, approve of that, but on a national level, uh, that's, that's a side one, though. But I don't have a specific concrete example of where uh, legislature, legislating could actually replace um, but I think that I've seen that in a lot of commentary on these issues. Well, so, and I oversimplify here, but uh, um, we've been talking here about constitutional issues, and of course, a huge amount of what courts do is, a, uh, is a statutory, and some of it is still common law. Um, so, uh, uh, it may very well be that some of the court's statutory decisions have happened in part because, you know, the, the Congress or state legislatures, say Congress, haven't gotten around to solving really tough questions and they just punt it to the courts, let's say. Or punt it to the regulatory agencies and then the courts have to decide what to do with that. So those are all very interesting arguments and maybe they're correct. Maybe, in fact, Congress should take more seriously writing clearer statutes or going and revising the statutes to keep keep up with uh, new developments rather than leaving it to courts to try to adapt them. Um, but I'm just not sure with the constitutional s situation, the fault is with the legislatures, except in so far as you think the legislatures haven't been aggressive enough at proposing constitutional amendments. But again, I think part of the problem there is you need two-thirds consensus in Congress and then among three-quarters of the legislatures. That's a hard thing to get for obvious reasons. Next question. The microphone. Yeah. Yes, for, for Mr. Flowers, is there room within uh, originalism for a structural individualism in addition to a textual individualism? To say, in addition to we're going to look to the original meaning of the First Amendment, that we're going to return questions to the states or rights to the people? Yeah, so I think so. Um, and I think it's consistent with the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, which is at least, and so let me focus on the Constitution first before the Bill of Rights, because incorporation makes the Bill of Rights harder. If you focus just on the, the uh, you know, article, Articles One, Article One, really, Article One, Two, and Three, we'll say, um, you look at that structure, one, one thing you could say, and, and I actually had a question uh, for Professor Ramsey about this, is Professor Ramsey was saying, if you're unclear about what the Constitution means, you defer to the political branches. I think that makes complete sense when you're dealing with maybe the Bill of Rights uh, or, and, and where states are involved. As a practical matter, you can imagine saying, uh, yeah, we should leave them with maximal freedom and our federal system sort of experiment with new ideas. But I don't think it works when you're dealing with the federal government because the federal government is a government of limited and enumerated powers. And so the structural originalism, I guess, uh, that I would 
point to is to say that when you're dealing with the federal government, they actually should be required to specifically identify the thing that permits their action. And if they can't clearly show that their action is permitted, it is therefore not permitted. I think that's consistent with the original design of the Constitution and with the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Um, but I think that becomes harder when you're dealing with the states because in states, the, the uh, presumption is the inverse, is that the state has the power to do something unless it's taken away by a state constitution or by the federal <coughs> constitution. So that was a really long way of saying I think the structural originalism point works really well for the original constitution. It's harder when you're dealing with the Bill of Rights and subsequent amendments. Any comments? No, we'll go to the next question. Microphone? Do you have a microphone? I don't have a microphone. Oh, pardon me. Gene. No. Uh, uh, Gene Meyer. Um, I, I have a question for uh, Ms. Yang. Um, there are really two parts to the sort of attacks on the judiciary, in, in, in a way. One is, per, is the sort of more directly personal attacks, whether it's at the Supreme Court level or even, at, even for other, other judges. Um, there's a second aspect, which is to take decisions you really don't like, and rather than saying, well, uh, yeah, the court said this and this, and I don't think they're right here, I don't think they're right here, and the decision's a mistake. To say the decision, because of the result it's reaching, is fundamentally illegitimate by its nature, which is a, a, some of what's going on now. Um, do you see those as sort of two different things, and what's your reaction? Yeah, so uh, I litigate now, so I'm, I'm out in the field, I'm in the trenches. Um, what I see now is I see it becoming a lot more personal, right? Um, so there's attribution to the, the, a judge, there's a developing a name of, you know, and a reputation to that judge. I also see um, a, a lot of tearing down of some of the decisions that are being made. And it's, it, so I man, I'm the, uh, I'm the chair of the crisis management practice group. I took that over from Ted O um, a few years ago. But, and so I see the media and I see the onslaught of the way the media works now, right? And, you know, like it or not, an unanswered sound bite, such as what you suggest, um, just continues to get picked up by all the different um, news platforms because everybody's trying to constantly look for content, right? And when you don't have anything else that actually counters it or suggests otherwise or explains it within context or gives some idea of why that jurist might have ruled that way, then it, it just sounds to the public um, that, that a wrong decision was made, right? And it's, you can't cherry pick like that. I mean, we all know, for those of us who are in court all the time, you know, it, the devil's in the details. Um, but I think what it does is it really starts to erode what's happening on the bench um, and that respect for the bench. You, I've seen recently more um, federal judges stepping down than I ever saw before um, for lots of different reasons. But I think some of this, um, you know, some of the attacks and some of the, the, the way the public deals with them and addresses them and the back to the politicization of the courts ha hasn't been an attractive piece of the job. So. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Pappas from the Phoenix Lawyers Chapter. I wanted to pick up, I guess, on, on Jean's question and also on some comments that uh, Deb Yang and Professor Volokh had made about the political violence uh, and threats facing the courts. It was reported yesterday that the federal judge overseeing the defamation case against uh, former President Trump advised the jurors never to disclose that they had served on the jury. Uh, earlier this month, there was a bomb threat to the house of the uh, judge overseeing the civil fraud trial involving former President Trump. Prior to that, his clerk had been doxxed. There were swatting incidents involving uh, Judge Chutkin from the District of Columbia District Court, as well as Jack Smith. Now, it's easy enough to just say, well, these things shouldn't happen, but they are happening. My questions are, first, um, what does this mean for the integrity and independence of the judiciary and the judicial process more broadly. And second, besides originalism, what can be done to address this? Well, let me just say, first of all, the answer is nothing good is what it means. And second, whatever merits originalism will have, solving that problem is not, uh, is not one. Uh, um, I mean, I, I think it actually could get 
much, much worse, and probably will get much, much worse. Uh, judges are, are extremely soft targets, including Supreme Court justices, but pretty much all judges. They quite rightly live in the community, they're well known, everybody knows where they are, people know who their children are, and if they don't, they can figure it out. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's a huge, huge problem. And I mean, it would be great if there was a lowering of the temperature of debate and, uh, uh, to the point where less endorsement of violence as, as a possible uh, response by both sides. Uh, but unfortunately, I just don't see the likelihood of that happening. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pessimistic about it. I, I, I'd love to hear some solutions. I just know well, what the solutions are. Yeah. I, 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 I'm sorry. Go no, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I agree the temperature is not going to lower. What you can do is increase the punishment for the bad behavior. <laughs> so uh, my former boss, Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost, was a victim of a swatting incident. And it's astonishing to me how, A, how seemingly hard that is to find the culprits because they don't get punished much. But even if they're caught, the punishment is not nearly as severe as you'd expect. Um, so I think uh, greatly enhancing the penalties for those, giving state and federal officials uh, more authority to go after individuals who do that because it is exceptionally dangerous. Um, it, it, it will lead to the death of somebody eventually. It's also bad for... It, police now go to these events not knowing if it's a real call or not, which we do not want a SWAT team having to deal with. So I think if we're not going to lower the temperature, we have to drastically uh, increase the punishment for that conduct, because right now it's not nearly harsh enough, and we don't do enough to find them. Yeah, you're going to get an answer from somebody with a deep law enforcement background, so I apologize to everybody. But listen, if I agree that this context is only going to get worse. I see it. I see more of it. Um, and people are, and it's not just like the crazies, like the old days, it's people who are purposeful, you know? Um, and so I think you need to actually crack down on them, sorry. And you need to do it in a very strong and, and uh, uh, serious way because it acts as a deterrent, right? Once the message goes out that you can't do something like this, that there's swift action, that they will you know, do what they can to find the perpetrator, it sends a message out. And while it, do, it isn't the ultimate solution, it is part of a solution. So I think some of that, and, and I think, you know, honestly, just building some things out um, around the courthouses and around the judges. It's, I forgot which one of you said it, but judges are completely soft targets. Um, it's it's difficult. You can't even without the way we do our identification now and here in the state of California, you can't even avoid it, right? And so your data, your facial recognition, all of your private information is in systems that get hacked into, not infrequently. So, I mean, th and think about the message the DOJ sent. With, in the lead up to Dobbs, you had illegal protests outside the justices' homes. They're trying to because they were trying to influence them with respect to a particular case, and the DOJ did nothing uh, until it eventually resulted in an assassination attempt, and they arrested that guy, but they still didn't stop the protest, and from what I understand, they still show up outside their homes. Um, so I think authorities need to send a much stronger message, as you're saying, that this stuff's not going to be tolerated. That wasn't violent but th until the assassination uh, attempt, uh, but it can easily grow into that sort of thing. And then when you have actual violence, like swatting, it has to be punished with incredible, um, incredibly harshly. I also think that you, they need to do things practically, right? You know me, I'm all about solutions. <laughs> um, but I think it's too easy to find the judges, right? Yeah. Because um, the DMV, you know, you name it, uh, clear at the airport, whatever, do doesn't have anything in it that gives it guidance that you actually have to like offload this or keep these in a separate place. No different than when I used to do FBI investigations and we had undercovers and we had backfilling. There's a mechanism to do that. Nobody's just ever done that. You need to work with these utilities and these agencies that keep that data and offload that data. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, I think when the judges first go on the bench, they need a deep training. You know, I sometimes for high net worth individuals, I have them walk around with former FBI heads and figure out where they have security risk. And it's just a, it's just another deterrent, right? Um, and it's those kinds of things when you add them up that will ultimately add to safety because, you know, you just put up a, another barrier. But those, t to me, seem like low-hanging fruit um, to try to get done. Uh, just real quickly, I, I agree with what everything that everyone has said, but I just wanted to add that I, I think that there, there has developed a, a, a 
culture of, uh, of violent and, and illegal protest and response to things that you don't like, whatever, whoever you are across the spectrum uh, in this country. I think the phenomenon of the, of the judges is, is just a piece of a much broader problem uh, that uh, the, the uh, violent and irresponsible protest has been generally tolerated, uh, and now we're seeing blowback from that. So I, I think there's a problem that needs to be addressed um, more broadly than, uh, than just within the... the uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Data Ren from Las Vegas. My question is for Mr. Flowers. You had indicated that the Janus factors, as presently used, maybe add to the politicization of the courts. Why is Justice Thomas's approach preferable to what Justice Scalia would say, which is ultimately we look at the workability of the rules that have come from the court? Uh, is that going? Would, would that approach be better than what Justice Thomas has suggested? And is it more true to originalist principles? Uh, I don't. I think Justice Thomas has a pretty good argument that his approach is consistent with originalist principles, though there are others on this panel who probably know more about that than I do. I guess in response to Justice Scalia's approach to, and, and I love the guy, uh, but his approach to stare decisis, the problem with it is the more factors you add in, the easier it is for a good lawyer and all good lawyers to justify any outcome they want. Every one of them can justify either overruling or not overruling any case. And at that point, you have to ask what's making the, what's really making the decision. Justice Thomas's approach at least articulates a specific thing you consider, and it's something that could be falsified. I mean, you say it's demonstrably incorrect, you could come back with evidence that it's not demonstrably incorrect. Um, now, is it perfect? No, there's still play in the joints there, as there is with most rules. But I think it does a much better job confining the the justice applying that rule to a uh, particular set of considerations that will, if properly applied, uh, yield a more determinative outcome. We have two minutes. Anybody else with a question? Uh, so I appreciate everyone's, uh, excuse me, Robert Christensen from Orange County. I liked all the commentaries, uh, the heady debate about originalism, and then I had the vision of seeing a Supreme Court justice uh, administering a mediation via Zoom after cleaning the bench. <laughs> And I think those practical questions are, uh, are important. And so in the spirit of discussion regarding advocating for the judiciary, uh, I had a question regarding compensation. It seems to me that these judges are grossly undercompensated. I think in California. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and no one's going to go on the record opposing this probably. But uh, what compensation would be appropriate? I think California was looking at the trial court judge makes under $200,000 a year. I think a Supreme Court judge makes approximately $330,000 a year. And now we're basically having, asking them not to have any investments to avoid any conflicts of interest. So how do we address compensation and what can be done to, I guess, advocate for the judiciary? Can I ask one quick follow-up question? Might actually the uh, um, uh, term limits have the advantage of pushing back the age at which people are appointed to the bench. That if somebody's only gonna be on for 18 years, more 60-year-olds or more 55-year-olds, let's say, would be appointed. And maybe the consequence will be that people, by the time they get on the bench, are going to have been successful big firm lawyers, or uh, if they haven't been successful big firm lawyers, they've gotten used to a level of, uh, <laughs> of, of income that uh, the, the, the bench isn't gonna be that bad for. One of the problems we have with the compensation of judges is it's historically been tied to the compensation of the congressmen. Correct. And uh, Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. congressmen are not going to the hustings saying, raise my salary. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, therefore, the, ju the judges uh, are hurt. And so not, we're not getting the best justice money can buy. <laughs> I do remember when I when I clerked on the Ninth Circuit, there was a case called Beer going through the I believe the Federal Circuit, where a bunch of judges, Article Three judges, were suing and saying their income was not being adjusted for inflation. And I just cannot imagine the government lawyer having to defend that the opposite position before a panel of Article Three judges. <laughs> I will comment then that we won that case. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please give a hand of applause.